Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Incarnate Word of God, make us worthy to praise you with sincerity, to glorify you with angelic psalms, and to celebrate with purity and holiness this feast when you were found in the temple, that we may glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the Eternal Father who sent His only begotten Son for our salvation, and to the Son who today explained His teachings to the scribes and to the teachers, and to the living, life-giving Spirit who has spoken through the prophets and the apostles. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. Blessed are you, O Jesus Christ, our Lord and God. You chose to go up to the temple with Mary and Joseph to fulfill the law of the Passover, which you had previously established and placed in the hands of your prophets. Today we celebrate the feast when you were found in the temple sitting among the teachers. You taught us that God must be first and last in all that we do. For our lives have no meaning except in our Lord and God. Now we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to enlighten our minds, that we may understand your love for us, which is the foundation of all your holy commandments. Strengthen our wills to act only for you. Guide our minds to think only of you, and fill our hearts with the true joy of pleasing you and doing your will. May our goal be the accomplishment of your works and those of your Father and of your Holy Spirit. To you be glory and thanks forever. Thank you. 
Glory to you, O holy God, you entered the temple as a child to fulfill the law. Now accept our incense and our prayers, and through them sanctify our souls and bodies, that we may become pure temples for you to dwell within us. We glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit forever. Kadishat Aloho Kadishat Chayelato no Kadishat Lo Mohoyoboto Mishiho Deti led Mehen Bat Dawid It Raha. Shout with joy from the mountains, see the temple of the Lord. Offer praise to the Lord God, its creator from of old. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and your children forever. Brothers and sisters, if then perfection came through the Levitical priesthood on the basis of which the people received the law, what need would there be to still have for another priest to rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not reckoned according to the order of Aaron? When there is a change in priesthood, there is necessarily a change of law as well. Now, he whom these things are said belonged to a different tribe of which no member ever officiated at the altar. It is clear that our Lord arose from Judah, and in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. It is even more obvious if another priest is raised up after the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become so, not by law expressed in commandment concerning physical descent, but by the power of a life that cannot be destroyed. For it is testified, you are a priest forever 
according to the order of Melchizedek. On the one hand, a former commandment is annulled because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law brought nothing to perfection. On the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. Praise be to God always. Why are you searching for me? Did you not know I must be in my Father's house? Praise, glory, and honor. No solution, it seems. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, who proclaim life to the world. Let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent, O listeners, for the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks to the word of the living God. The evangelist Luke writes, each year, his parents went up to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to this festival custom. After they had completed its days, and as they were returning, the boy Jesus remained behind in Jerusalem. But his parents did not know this. Thinking that he was in the caravan, they journeyed for a day and they looked for him among their relatives and acquaintances. But not finding him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the rabbis, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astounded at his understanding and at his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been looking for you with great anxiety. And he said to them, How is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand what he had said to them. But he went down with them, and he came to Nazareth, and he was obedient to them. And his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus advanced in wisdom and age and grace before God and man. This is the truth, peace be with you. Jesus Christ, our Lord and God. 
And his mother kept all these things in her heart. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What does it mean to be close to Jesus and Mary? During these days, we've been looking at the nativity, the actual moment that eternity enters into time, the birth of our Lord, or the slaughtering of the holy innocents, the boys around Bethlehem, and the forced exile then, of course, of St. Joseph and Our Lady and the child into Egypt until Herod dies. So the question becomes, what does it actually mean to grow closer to Jesus and to Mary? You know, over the years, over these last three decades, no matter where I'm at on the planet, there have always been good, very good people in the parishes who have come up and who have said, you know, Father, the harder I try, the harder it seems to get. You know, the more faithful that I try to be the Catholic life, things just seem to get harder. These narratives that we have from St. Luke, and of course the one of the exile and the slaughtering of the boys and the Magi is St. Matthew. But most of these details we have from the mother herself. Remember that the Gospel of St. Luke is founded upon, at least the first part of it, is founded upon the interviews with Our Lady. And it's significant that that detail, that she ponders these things in her heart. She meditates on these things, she thinks about these things. And at the time when St. Luke would have been speaking to her, this would have been years after the Ascension. And yet we can know for sure that Mary of Nazareth, the mother of God, was thinking about these things still. This is what it means when we grow closer to Jesus and to Mary. Of course, on the one hand, when they say, well, my life just seems to get more difficult, illnesses, accidents, whatever may take place. Of course, what they're not complaining, they're not complaining about that life. They're just mystified by, when I try to follow God more faithfully, why does it seem to get harder? Of course, when they step back and they look at their lives, they know that their lives have become more beautiful and more peaceful, radiant, in fact. And these have been very, very good people who try, and they're trying hard. And yet we're told in the gospel in these, child, these narratives around the infancy that so often Mary and Joseph don't understand these things, but they think about them, they pray on them, they meditate on them, they consider them. And that's really the key to this whole idea of moving forward. There's an engagement that has to be in our lives. Our Lord says to us, you know, I am the vine and you are the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. He didn't say a little bit, tiny bit, you can be good and sweet and wonderful and kind of a child of God. No, without me, you can do nothing. When our Lord says to those who follow him later on in his life, he says, if you wish to be my disciples, if you wish to learn from me, you have to take up your cross daily and follow me. This is an engagement that is required. And he says to the disciples, knock and it shall be opened to you. Ask and you shall be received. Christianity is not magic. It's not something that's done to us. Because somebody dumped water on me at one point, we called it a baptism, and I live my life like the rest of the world and somehow I die and wing off to some happy place that we call heaven these days. That's not Christianity. I don't know what it is, but it certainly isn't Christianity. Christianity is discipleship, the ability to hear the word and to ponder that word, to weigh that word, to meditate on that word, and to move further into this mystery of God's recreation, renewal of human, humanity. And that's why these stories of the nativity are so important. Well, tomorrow, of course, we have the Feast of the Epiphany, Little Christmas, Twelfth Day. And of course, for us, it's a holy day of obligation. And for the Easterners, of course, it's Christmas itself. It predates the celebration of December 25th by a century. The Egyptians tomorrow, the Russians, the Greeks, all the Eastern Mediterraneans celebrate Christmas tomorrow. And yet, how many of us have already yanked everything down and thrown it back in the attic? They missed the point. 
They don't decorate it Halloween. Halloween has nothing to do with Christmas. The nativity in the 12 days, this manifestation, is why we have this great feast tomorrow. But the nativity, all these beautiful stories that we know so well, coming of the Magi, the star, the shepherds, the angels, they're beautiful stories, and yet the key to the story is not all of that stuff. The story is about what, goes, what happens to Jesus and Mary and to Joseph, and especially to Joseph and to Mary, the two human beings that are fully around the Messiah, bringing him into this world, into time, the word incarnate, the engagement that's required of them, and of course, as we saw on the night of the nativity, in the middle of the night when our Lord is born, Joseph and Mary are left in silence. They don't see the angels, they hear no singing, they have nothing. God gives them nothing. Just faith that this child who comes into this world is the awaited one, the Messiah. And then of course, the following year, the coming of the Messiah, the, the coming of the Magi, excuse me, the coming of the Magi, and Herod's fury, the slaughtering of the boys, and their forced exile off into Egypt again. It's Joseph and Mary around the Messiah. Life is not easy. And then, of course, when we come to this whole episode when the boy's now 12, we're told nothing between those early scenes and then he's 12, and he brings them ultimately what seems to be the very worst story possible. Even on a human level for a family, this is atrocious to lose your child. And not just for the afternoon, not just you, he wanders down the wrong aisle at the grocery store. He's gone at the end of the day. It's like, why didn't we look earlier? The reason why the confusion comes in is because the boy's 12 and he's bar mitzvah. Bar mitzvah, he's the son of the law. So religiously, he's considered an adult. It's like receiving confirmation, chrismation. He's considered an adult religiously, which is why when they do find him later on in the temple, he's with the rabbis, he's with the teachers. He's considered, he's not just a kid. He's a son of the law, and so the rabbis speak to him, and they marvel at the perceptive answers that this young man gives, this 12-year-old boy gives. But because on the chronological level, the boy's only 12, he might be traveling with the women in the caravan. He might be traveling with the men in the caravan because he's only 12. 16, you're with the men. So then neither, one, neither Joseph, who's with the men, or Mary, who's with the women, thinks about the fact that, well, Jesus isn't here with us. He must be with Joseph. Jesus is not with me. He must be with Miriam. And that's why only at the end of the day, when they finally settle in for the night on this travel, they start looking for him, and they realize he's not here. The first thing every parent would think, this was terrible. Why didn't we pay better attention? Why didn't we check with each other to see if the child was here? And then it grows deeper, of course, because now they have to travel another day into the city to get back to Jerusalem, and then spend another tired day find, trying to find him. That's why it takes three days, the anxiousness of it. There's no Amber Alerts, there's no cell phones, there's no nothing. You have to physically go through Jerusalem, which during the Passover swelled to hundreds of thousands of people. The city just simply mushroomed in population when everyone just swarmed down of the pilgrims. So that Jesus gave them days to think about this. So what's happening on one level is just simply a family story. They lost their son, he's gone, we can't find him. And there's this, this, this terror that you're not, what happened to him? And of course, when they find him, and they find him sitting at the temple and he's with the rabbis and they're discussing their catechism, he's discussing the prophecies, the rabbis are astonished and Mary and Joseph are just beside themselves in all of these emotions that they've gone through for the last three days. And so Our Lady says to him, how could you have done this to us? But his answer is even further onto this, because you think during those three days, they know this child is the Messiah. They know this child is the one that God is sending for the salvation of the world. So on a religious level, their thought is, what did we do wrong? 
Did we do something wrong? Why has he gone away from us? Why did he stay back in the city? Have we done something? Have we been some way failing him? And so when that question is asked, how is it that you could do this to us? The answer is even worse than at that point. How is it that you've been looking for me? It's a very profound answer for this young man to say to them. You are looking for me. Are you looking for me as a child? Are you looking for me as the redeemer of the world? Are you looking for me as the Messiah? Or are you just looking for me as little 12-year-old Jesus? Didn't you know that I must be about my father's affairs? Now, oftentimes you see in the translations, it will say, in my father's house. In the Greek, it's rather unusual. Antois tu patros mu, which literally means that I have to be among the things, the things of my father. In other words, it's time to begin this work of the redemption. How otherwise would you expect me? This 12-year-old is pushing them further into understanding of the work of God, the plan of salvation. And then he goes home with them. And we're told that the rest of the time, the next 18 years, he's obedient and he's at home. So for us in that initial question, the silence of the night, being forced into exile, the slaughter of the boys, the babies around Bethlehem, and now 12 years later, Jesus withdraws himself. This is very much a lesson for us in the spiritual life. That question originally from those people that have asked me throughout the parishes. The harder I try to do faithfully, I'm at Mass every Sunday, I pray, I pray the rosary, I do these things. I fast during the fasting seasons. I fast on Wednesday, I fast on Friday. I fast, I do these things, and life seems to get harder. That's the finding in the temple. There are times in which Jesus will seem to withdraw himself from us, but he's not gone. But he's teaching us, how is it that you're looking for me? Do you think it just happens to you because you know the name Jesus that all of a sudden the gospel is open to you? How is it that you sought me? How do you look for me? So he pushes them further. He knows that it causes them pain. He knows that it causes them anguish for days. And yet, he still does this to them because he loves them. To enter into the mystery. We all have members in our family who don't want to enter into the mystery. They make up the apostate population of Maine, which is the majority of the state. Christianity requires engagement to listen, to knock, to have the door open, to ask, to receive. Nothing's given to us free. As we've talked about the different stories of individuals like St. Rafka or St. Rita of Kashia, these are women who ask, Lord, give me an understanding of your passion. That sounds beautiful, especially during Lent, right? I want to understand the sufferings of our Lord. And he takes them at that value. And as we know with St. Rafka, she spends the next four decades of her life being blinded, having migraines, and ultimately paralyzed for the last decade of her life because she knocked and the door was open to her. And she had an understanding of that passion. Was it fun? Was it easy? No. Was it filled with the light of wisdom? Absolutely. And did it originate from an infinite love, which is God? Certainly. God's ways are not our ways. And that's what the child is teaching us when he leaves. It's why it's one of the joyful mysteries of the rosary, the finding of the Christ child in the temple. We have to know the story in depth to understand why we even call it a mystery. It's not just, well, we lost a kid. It is an entire foundation to teach these two people Yes, you are my parents. Yes, I will listen to you. Yes, I am obedient, but I am much more than that. I am also 
the Word of God incarnate. And I am here to teach you much more than you, Joseph, are meant to teach me how to make a table. I have much more to give you than you have to give me, even if you nursed me as a baby. This is the whole foundation of the spiritual life. And so on one way, it's very discouraging to think, well, if I try harder, then somehow the cross will appear more in my life. But we know that the cross in the Syriac tradition is life-giving, luminous, it is living. That cross is in a reality which brings life. And so we ask this day that God open our hearts and our spirits and our minds even further so that with great generosity, not only do we knock at the door, not delicately, but that we pound on that door to be opened to us so that we may understand, that we may be given the grace to follow, to engage with our Lord so that we may enter more deeply into it. And when we do that, then we enter into the epiphany to understand the manifestation of the Trinity, just tomorrow's feast. And so we ask for that opening of our hearts, the generosity, and that sometimes we have to close our eyes and grit our teeth because we know that it may not be pleasant. But we know it will be beautiful, and we know that it will be suffused and penetrated completely with the peace of God, which only God can give. So may we knock, may we ask, and it be opened and given to us in the light of the glory of the Word incarnate. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Continue on page 748, the Creed. We believe in one God. Tell what Madepe da Loho, Walwater Loho, Dampade Tamu, 
have the sheets in the pew for the transfer him for the nativity Almighty Lord in God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you. Out of their love for you and for your holy name, shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Charbel. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially for those who the sacrifice is offered for the intentions for all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. 
Lord God and Father, holy and glorious is your name. You deliver those who love you from all that is contrary to your will. May we who have remained in your divine love be made worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with a holy kiss. May we always speak words of peace, think of peace, and work for peace. Through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people, we raise glory to you and to your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord. hidden from all creation, you are peace, reconciling those who are enemies. You are forgiveness to those who sin. You are comfort to those who are sorrowful. Open the door of your mercy to our petitions, and in the abundance of your grace, accept our prayers. Make us children and heirs of your kingdom through your grace of your only Son and his love for all people, and through your Holy Spirit, now and forever. <coughs> O oh Lord, you are adored by all. Angels bless you, humanity exalts you, and all creation glorifies you. Look upon your children who call out to you. With purity and holiness, may we offer you an acceptable sacrifice, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. Truly it is right and just to thank, adore, glorify, and bless the majesty of the one consubstantial Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a majesty that does not need our glory or become greater with our things. O Lord, those who sing your praises are countless, and they cry out with angelic voices, and with sweet melodies proclaiming... Father, for you have exalted our weak human nature. In your mercy you sent your only Son into the world for our salvation. He dawned from the Holy Virgin like a ray of light from a bright cloud. He took the form of a slave, yet truly he is the Son of your majesty. He willingly became man to make us divine. 
He was born from a woman's womb, that we may be born again from a spiritual womb. He became our brother, so that through his grace we may become your children and heirs. He took us from being slaves and made us your children. He promised us a share in the reward that allows us to call you Abba, Father. He cleansed us from our sins with his precious blood that he poured out for us. For he is your only Son. And Sabe Lahmo Bida Kodi Shanto Ubar Hukade Waksoya Belitalmita Kado Mara Sabe Hulu Mene Kuluho Ono Denita Fahuru Kalkoso <laughs> Do this in memory of me. Each time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember my death until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your mercy rest upon us. O word of God, who can comprehend that you willingly emptied yourself of your divine glory, who can explain your miraculous birth from a virgin, who can repay you for your saving passion which you freely endured, who can praise your plan of salvation for us. We can only ask of you, O lover of all people, that the sacrifice which we have offered be accepted on your holy altar in heaven the dwelling place of your hidden divinity in the company of all the angels and saints. Through this sacrifice, may we be worthy of the forgiveness of our sins. When you come to judge the living and the dead, do not pass judgment upon us, nor deny us, saying, I do not know you. On that glorious and fearful day, do not separate us from you, nor cast us out of your paradise, to a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Rather, because of your holy name, by which we have been called, look with mercy upon us. In your compassion you have made us worthy of the gift of your forgiving body and blood. So make us worthy to be one with you in holiness, as you are one with your Father. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, O mighty Father, have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. Also 
welcome is this moment, O my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Anin morio, anin morio, anin morio, ni te modoro ho chayu kadisho. Una chenna lainu aru korbono ho no. This bread, the body of Christ our God, be for us a pledge of the life to come, a body that grants us the everlasting joys of heaven, a body that renews our souls and bodies, a body that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. And that the mixture in this chalice, the blood of Christ our God, be a blood that gives new life to those who receive it, a blood that guides us to the safe harbors and the dwellings of light, a blood that renews our souls and bodies, a blood that purifies us of all sin for eternal life. Amen. O Lord, in your great mercy, when this body and blood is mingled with our bodies and souls, grant that it may be for the pardon of faults, of forgiveness of sins, and for the everlasting joy and eternal life with all your saints. Amen. We offer you, Lord God, this pure and holy offering for your holy Catholic and apostolic church, which you have redeemed. Gather her children into unity, love, and faith, and guide them in peace and security. We offer it for the pure bishops of the true faith, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bashar Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, the Venerable Priests, the Chaste Deacons, the Pure Subdeacons, and all the Orders of the Church. Teach them the word of truth, so that they may spread it faithfully, with justice and holiness. May they care for the flock that you have entrusted to them. Give them the proper means to accomplish your will, and grant them a long life. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord of goodness, your holy church, and have mercy on all her faithful. In your compassion, heal all the wounded and injured among your flock. Punish injustice and strengthen all our brothers and sisters. Bestow the grace of conversion on all. With your indestructible power, strengthen the bishops of the true faith, that they may be upright and courageous in their apostolic office. May they show fidelity as they stand ever before your eternal justice. Unto your honor and glory, may they prove themselves upright, dauntless, and persevering in the task confided to them. To lead all the faithful into the fullness of your redeeming light and glory. We pray to you, O oh Lord. For the poor and dejected, for orphans and widows, for the sick and distressed, and for those tempted by evil spirits, be the guardian and refuge of their lives. We pray to you, O oh Lord. Remember the holy fathers, prophets, apostles, preachers, evangelists, martyrs, and confessors, especially the holy, glorious, and blessed ever Virgin Mary, Mother of God, Saint John the Baptist, the messenger and forerunner, who witnessed the betrothal of your holy church to your son, glorious Saint Stephen, the archdeacon and first martyr, and all who pleased you and professed your name, we pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all the faithful departed who have gone to you from this altar and from every place throughout the world, grant them rest in your heavenly dwellings with all your saints, and in your mercy forgive our sins and theirs. Grant rest, O God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have. 
O Lord, do not deprive us of your mercy, but keep us in the palm of your hand, lest we fall and go astray, so that we may walk on your paths, follow your ways, and do your will. Forgive us and our departed, and pardon all sins and transgressions, hidden and seen, committed with or without full knowledge. Make us worthy of a faithful Christian death that is pleasing to you, and join us to your righteous ones and to those who have done your will. That in us and in all things your blessed name may be glorified with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. O Lord, our Lord, you sent us your only Son, who is the radiance of your eternity. And he accomplished his plan of salvation for us, that we may come to you. May we call upon you with the prayer that he taught his holy disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, power, glory, and glory, now and forever. Yes, O merciful Lord, we ask for your compassion. By your grace, make us worthy, that your glorious name may be made holy in us that your kingdom come to assist us in our weakness, and that your will dwell within us. Deliver us from all difficult temptations. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord God, you are good and the lover of all people. Look upon those who bow their heads before your majesty and bless them with every spiritual blessing. Do not turn us away when we approach your divine and holy gifts, and let us not be guilty of unworthily receiving the body and blood of your only Son. Rather, make us worthy to share in your holy and life-giving mysteries with purity, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your good and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit, let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility, and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, 
purity and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory.
Lord Jesus, you have made us worthy to share in your holy body and in the cup of salvation. How can we repay you for these your gifts and graces and for your goodness? As you have called us to approach this life-giving banquet, make us worthy, so that your body may be mingled with our bodies and your blood with our souls for the pardon of faults, the forgiveness of sins, and for eternal life. You are blessed and your kingdom is holy. We raise glory to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit now and forever. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. O God the Father, we bow before you and we entrust ourselves to your care. We ask you, imploring your mercy to rest your right hand, full of blessings, upon us. Assist us, protect us, Bless us and sanctify us by the Holy Cross of your only Son. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. So just the brief reminder, though we had more people here last night, obviously some of your cousins were terrified by the huge snowstorm this morning. So please call to remind them that the Holy Day, of course, is tomorrow, the Great Epiphany, the Great Manifestation. And so as a holy day for us, we have an obligation to be at Mass. And so like a normal Sunday schedule, Mass will be tomorrow at 10. But for those who have the misfortune and the, or the unfortunate aspect of working for pagans, which is most of us, and have to work tomorrow, well then we have the Vigil Mass this evening at 4. So there's 4 o'clock this evening, 10 o'clock tomorrow. I know it's a lot. They're all back to back. I met every one of them, so hey, you only have to come. So call all of your cousins, tell them the roads are fine, and we'll look forward to seeing them for the little Christmas epiphany. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.